Welcome to KB Cast, the podcast for security executives, interviewing people from around the globe on how organizations can operate smarter and stay safer. Here's Carissa Breen. I sat down with Mike from Hack Hunter and we had a pretty long and thorough chat. We spoke at length about Mike's career in the industry, how he's navigated through various roles before landing himself in his very own startup, and what they're doing in the field today. We spoke about the risks around home Wi-Fi and how you can improve your home security and some of his advice on how to combat that. If you're keen to learn more about Mike's experience, then please keep on listening. So, Mike, thank you so much for for joining us today on our show. And I think we got connected through Twitter, through one of your colleagues. And then when you and I spoke, I was really interested about what you guys are doing at Hack Hunter. And I wanted to explore that. Before we do that, I'd love to start off with talking about you and your journey. So if you can just walk our listeners through where you started to what you're doing now. Cool. I'll try to do this quickly. Yeah, I started out life studying to be a geneticist and zoologist, believe it or not. <laughs> Interesting uh, uh, career choice. Uh, but there was just no work at the end of that process. So uh, I quickly found myself scrambling for a, a job in government. I was fortunate that the department I worked in was uh, computerizing. It was actually the first early days of social security computerization, or as Centrelink as it's known now. Okay. Uh, and I had a bit of an aptitude for the computing side of things, so uh, I quickly sort of went through the ranks and ended up running uh, their security operations in Victoria and uh, the help desk and a couple of other things along the way and made my way into private enterprise from there. I was a CISO for an insurance company for about four and a half years and had the good fortune to uh, uh, have to deal with a computer fraud case while I was there, which was quite fascinating. It's a whole story in its own right. Um, I had to live at the sort of manage a building fire as well while I was in charge of business continuity planning. So that was fun as well. So I had some good experience there, then moved into a consulting role in uh, SMS consulting. Uh, it was there for eight and a half years. It was a great place to work and uh, got some great experience across a number of companies and was fortunate enough to uh, work with some, you know, really big companies and uh, privacy commission and quite a few other uh, organizations in a security role. Uh, so that was good. And I, I basically set up their national security practice for about eight and a half years there. Then moved into uh, our own business uh, called Linus Information Security Solutions. Ran that for about 17 years. Started out doing consulting work, the usual sort of, you know, raise cash, then developed some software for the company, which ended up becoming about 60% of our revenue, which was great. And um, it actually won some uh, international awards as well. So that was really cool. So we started to uh, end up becoming a, a big fish in a very tiny pond. And we actually sold out of that company in 2017 and formed Hack Hunter as we're here today. So, uh, yeah, and that really came about through my interest in IoT, uh, microelectronics. And I did a lot of home automation stuff and 3D printing and things like that on the side. So I always had an interest in that area. And that sort of combining with my security knowledge and having the opportunity to really sit back and, you know, think about uh, career choice and direction uh, after uh, exiting the previous company. Um, it was a really good opportunity to get into the startup sphere. We we're very fortunate. Uh, my wife, Tracy, who's, uh, who's been a fantastic advocate of the startup industry and got us involved in that space through Startmate. We were selected into the Startmate cohort in 2018 uh, and also got selected into the SciRise Accelerator Program in the, in the following, uh, following year, so in 2019. So, yeah, that was a, um, that was a great experience and uh, really helped set us up for Hack Hunter. Wow, that's really interesting. You talk about a building fire. I don't know many many people have gone through something like that in terms of a BCP perspective and a, and a DR perspective. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So for the record, uh, people listening, that Mike was telling us before he jumped on that he does have a 3D printer going on in the background. So it just goes to show that 100% what you said in terms of you're well-versed in this space and you absolutely love it. So when, when we did originally speak, I was really intrigued by what you guys are doing for two reasons. One, just purely about what Hack Hunter is doing, but then because of the relevancy of what's happening in the market. So can you just explain to our audience what you guys do and the outcomes that you're getting for clients? But then I I believe this is so relevant because what's happening in our world at the moment, as you could talk through quite intelligently. So I'm just I'm really keen to to dive on into this. Yeah, yeah. So what Hack Hunter is all about is 
we've we've built a uh, if you like a technology that detects and tracks uh, Wi-Fi with precision. And the reason why this is quite unique is that there's been solutions around for a long time that um, you know if you configure your laptop correctly and you whack on external antenna, you can use things like Harley Linux to you run some scripts and maybe detect some anomalies in your network. Nobody's built a sort of a handheld portable device that's like capable of doing this uh, on any decent scale. So if you've ever been involved in doing, say, a Wi-Fi audit, you'll see people walking around with one hand trying to carry a laptop, another hand with a pen and paper, and, and carrying their charger and other kit in a, in a, back, a, a rucksack on their back, uh, running around the office having to stop every couple of hours to recharge their battery, uh, having to put the laptop down so they can type some notes in as they go. And even that, that technology is not good enough to even track down some, if you like, occurrences of malicious Wi-Fi. So it's a very cumbersome, very difficult thing to do, particularly if you've got a few buildings to do, with quite a lot of floors. Uh, so the large organisations really kind of suffer with this. Plus, you know, the, there's also uh, people who are in the penetration testing industry and so on do a lot of Wi-Fi work. So they need some uh, devices that can do this well, can do it um, uh, ergonomically, if you like. So what we've developed is if you think of it as a, we built a high-speed uh, packet analysis engine on a chip. And what that enables us to do is that we can, it's a bit like having Wireshark in your pocket. You can basically create a template and say, I want to make this device track down and look for a disgruntled employee by typing in the MAC address of the phone that they previously used. And it'll actually find that Wi-Fi pattern. It'll actually let you track that person down. You could say, I just want this device to tell me if somebody's attacking the network. And it'll do that. But very importantly, you'll not only detect it, but it'll actually let you walk around and track down the actual perpetrator or the device that's actually causing the problem. I'm not sure if you can get a visual, but that's the actual device, the little handheld tracking system uh, that we use. So, and of course, it runs on batteries for probably about uh, six or seven hours or up to 12, 15 hours, depending on the battery you use. So you can do a full day's audit and you can not only track things down, you can actually note them on the device, you know, what floor I was on, did I find a bad guy or not, et cetera. And I think probably the most important thing to appreciate here is that a lot of people believe that, you know, their routers are already protecting them and, you know, we're detecting anomalies in corporate networks all the time. But they don't have the necessary technology to actually pinpoint the precise issues or the precise device that's causing it. So I'll give you an example. If um, I can actually hide a malicious Wi-Fi device uh, in clothing or, in, you know, you can have it in your bag, Anywhere in a pocket, that doesn't matter. It, you could hide in the ceiling, you put in a pot plant. They're tiny battery powered devices you would never find unless you had the ability to track these things with precision. So, uh, even the big companies who have some very sophisticated networks that can triangulate on devices that they can find, they can only tell you that that device is like within a five meter sphere. They can't tell you if it's hidden in the ceiling or in the floor or uh, in somebody's clothing, in somebody's pocket or a bag. Uh, whereas our device can track that down in seconds and, and find the perpetrator. So uh, it's actually quite valuable, and some people may not be aware that the number of incidents that occur with this, but we did a floor walk exercise with one of the big four banks. Mm -hmm. um, we were testing out our gear, uh, and we actually found a device hidden under the floor. Uh, we found a, a potential state actor. Um, we found a device hidden in a gym bag on the corner of the floor that was transmitting. Uh, and when we went up to it to actually find out what pocket it was in, it actually was remotely turned off. And this is all within a two-day audit. That audit's only typically run once every three months. So you can imagine how often this occurs in organisations, particularly with thousands of people or potentially if they've got a very confidential or uh, important information at hand. So it, it's quite, a, quite a, a big task for people and certainly um, a growing issue, not just for corporates, but for when people are travelling or away from the corporate environment. So what happened with the uh, situation with the gym bag? Just curious. Yes. Yeah, so, well, basically, it was there was nobody physically in the area, which was interesting. So that in itself is kind of like, you know, plant something where nobody can be uh, identified. And then when it got turned off, of course, all we could do at that point was to try and identify the actual source in the bag. Um, but a separate team in the in the bank were called in to, uh, to investigate that. So I wasn't privy to, to those final details, but just okay. to, I'm sure they investigated it very thoroughly. <laughs> Yeah, and similarly with, you know, there are a lot of these things that aren't big issues. For example, you know, some of the devices we found were, you know, just purely old equipment that they forgot to turn off that was, you know, stuck in a corner or people who were hotspotting their phones and doing things they shouldn't do in the work environment. So a lot of it was innocent as well, but certainly a significant proportion is a big concern for these organisations. And that and that's in a controlled environment where the organisations have, you know, very sophisticated networks and controls. 
even in those environments, they're still very vulnerable. And I think that's one of the problems with Wi-Fi itself is that people don't realise how vulnerable the protocol is, that it's actually quite open to abuse. And it's unlikely to change for many, many years, uh, even with the new standards that are coming in. So it's been a problem for a while. I think it's going to become more of a problem. Uh, we have, well, in 2021, it's predicted that over 50% of all internet traffic will be via Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a statistic put forward by Cisco, actually. So that'll give you an idea that even with cell networks and 5G and everything else out there that we're using to connect to the internet, Wi-Fi is still the dominant form and it's actually growing faster than any other. So, you know, that's an important note to take is that this problem is is not going away. So you spoke about controlled environments. Let's talk about uncontrolled environments. And I think it's it's pretty interesting time to be having this chat with you, Mike, because uh, as we spoke about, we're talking more about now that people are working from home mm -hmm. and you sort of raised some very interesting concerns about some of the issues that are now arising. So can you talk through a little bit more from that perspective? Yeah, yeah, sure. So when you're in a corporate environment, you'll connect to a protected Wi-Fi network that usually has some pretty strong controls, you know, certificates and a whole number of other things that might be used to connect to make sure that valid devices are connected to the network. But what people don't realize is that um, there's, there's two parts to this. One is that uh, even in that protected environment, you're still vulnerable. Uh, and secondly, you're even more vulnerable when you're at home or away from the office. So to give you an idea um, of how vulnerable people are, probably the easiest way to describe it is to talk about something called the man in the middle attack. So if you're familiar with devices like uh, Wi-Fi pineapples, these are devices mm -hmm. that can generate fake access points. In other words, they look like the corporate network, but not the corporate network. So the way these man in the middle attacks work is that all of us have a, a phone or a laptop, and I'm sure right now your phone remembers your home network. Is, it, is that the case? Like if you walk home, it'll automatically mm -hmm. connect to home Wi-Fi? Yeah, I would say most people have that as well. Yeah, yeah. So what that means is you might ask the question, how does your phone automatically know to connect to the home network when you get home? And the answer is actually pretty simple. Your phone, roughly every 10 seconds, sends out a little blurb called a probe request saying, hey, home Wi-Fi, are you here? Hey, home Wi-Fi, are you here? And the minute it gets a response back saying, hey, I'm your home Wi-Fi, they connect, they exchange credentials, and, and the connection's made. And that all happens automatically. The phone's still in your pocket, and all of a sudden you're connected to your home network. So what a man-in-the-middle attack does, it actually sits and listens for those probe requests coming from your phone. So your phone, even when your phone is at work, if it's not connected to a Wi-Fi network, it'll be saying, hey, home Wi-Fi, are you there? Hey, home Wi-Fi, are you there? So as a hacker, all I do is listen to that. I then create an access point that looks like your home network. And when you walk past it, you'll automatically connect to the hacker's network. Mm -hmm. And then I can have full control of your communications to the internet or wherever else uh, we want to channel those communications. So I can create fake DNS locations, fake web servers, uh, fake banking pages, uh, anything I want that uh, you, know, you might want to log into or that even is automatically happening on your phone. So your phone is actually talking to the internet all the time. So automatically that we can then sift and, and collect all that traffic coming through from that phone. So um, it, is, it is a big problem. So if I just you know sat in a cafe next to the, the front of a big office block, um, I could probably capture a lot of credentials of corporate employees. And if you take that to the home situation, you know, there's even less protection for, for people at home. So what do you think corporations are doing? Because I'm assuming that they know this is an issue. Mm -hmm. What are they actually doing to control some of these concerns that you've just raised and ultimately it's hard because in a normal environment it's a bit easier but now people they don't really have a choice uh, their staff have had to work from home so are they managing this uh, and if they are how are they going about doing this yeah so uh, you know all good corporations will have some standards security standards that they want people to abide by when they're working from home and, and most of those are quite sensible but there's unfortunately not much the corporation can do from a determined attacker uh, with the right techniques. So most corporations will ask their employees to use VPNs or virtual private networks to connect into their work environment so that all the traffic is encrypted between those two points so they can't be eavesdropped on or, or intercepted uh, during that transaction. The trouble is that if you're if you're a corporate uh, employee, are you going to use a VPN for everything? You know, your kids uh, are on the network. Other people you might be using the network. You might be watching Netflix, whatever it is. You're not going to do that through a VPN all the time. So your credentials uh, could easily be captured 
outside the use of the VPN. And there are vulnerabilities with VPNs as well. So there are actually a number of areas that can be exploited. And typically all I would have to do for a home network is to uh, hack the password for your Wi-Fi network. And there are a number of relatively straightforward ways to do that. Once I had that password, I can actually capture all the traffic from your home router, every single bit, and I can store it and then I can go away, I can decrypt it and find out every bit of information that was sent across that network. Now, a lot of people might say, look, I'm always connecting to a HTTPS site or a, a secure website, so my information is encrypted anyway. So even if they eavesdrop, that wouldn't be a problem. But it is a problem, and the reason is that not all these areas are encrypted. For example, your home printer, right? When you send stuff across Wi-Fi, for example, to your home printer, I guarantee you most homes printers aren't HTTPS protected. So what that means is every time you send a document to your printer, if I listen to your Wi-Fi connection and have your Wi-Fi password for your network, I can decrypt the entire page contents of those documents uh, anytime I want. So, you know, a lot of people don't realize that. And certainly VPNs aren't necessarily going to solve that problem because you don't normally use a VPN to connect to your home printer. So there are a number of areas like that make uh, home use really quite vulnerable. Now, I know that we were going to jump into more of a scenario type thing. We'll, we'll do it anyway, but I think we should also tack on some assumptions. Mm -hmm. So the scenario is Lara works at HR consultant for a multinational, and she's now working from home on a corporate laptop, yep. which automatically connects to her home Wi-Fi. But Lara also now has two kids who are in school that are also uh, leveraging the same home Wi-Fi. So – over to you, Mike, to walk through some of your concerns. Yeah, so probably the first one is the password for the network itself. So most people will be using what we call WPA2 encryption on their network, and that's pretty much the standard. The problem with that is that it uses a, a specific method of handshaking or exchanging of credentials. And if you listen to the network, you can actually capture what's called the uh, the handshake packets for that connection, and you can use that to decrypt passwords on the network. So if a person uses a really strong password, this can be much harder for a hacker to guess, but a lot of people use the default passwords that come with the Telstra Big Pond modem or Netgear equipment or whatever it comes out. So they're actually quite easy to crack because there's a, you know, it's a pretty standard format for the structure of those keys. And also people can use things like WPS. So WPS is a feature where if you click a button on your router, and then you you know connect on your phone, it'll automatically set up the connection for you. You don't have to worry about typing in the credentials. And there are actually a number of attacks specifically designed around WPS to be able to hack into networks that way as well. And if you look at, this is really quite unfortunate, one of the, the most concerning, if you like, vulnerabilities on Wi-Fi networks is what we call a deauth or deauthentication attack. So deauth attacks work by force disconnecting devices off the network. What happens if I ran a, a deauth attack, for example, on your home Wi-Fi or, or her home Wi-Fi network, what will happen is all her network equipment will disconnect from the, her Wi-Fi and she won't be able to get access to the internet or a local network, anything connected by Wi-Fi. And that will continue. She'll never be able to connect those devices as long as I have that device running, generating the, what's called deauth packets. Now, those devices can be bought for China for a few dollars and they're very easy to make. I've, I've built plenty of them over time. And unfortunately, the vulnerability that causes that problem, which is known as unencrypted management frames, causes the issue. That problem was patched back in 2009, but it just shows you how difficult it is for even these patches to make their way into manufactured equipment. My Telstra router that I've got, which is only recently upgraded uh, on the NBN, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's vulnerable to the attack as well. So, you know, the router manufacturers are just going for the cheapest possible way to get equipment out, um, and they don't build these features in. Mm -hmm. So person at home, I can actually stop them getting access to the network at all via Wi-Fi. That's number one. Number two, by using a deauth, when I deauthenticate a device, the device then tries to reconnect back to the network. And when it does that, it does a password exchange or a hash exchange with the router again. And then I can trap those hashes and use them to crack the password. So deauth attacks are used both ways to deny service, but also to get access to password hashes. And that's very useful if you're a hacker, of course, if you can get the password, you can decrypt other traffic, et cetera. So, you know, and the other thing with kids on the network as well at home, you don't necessarily know what sites they're going to unless you've got some inbuilt controls and they could be surfing anywhere. They could also be downloading um, malicious material that they don't even know about. They could also be using the, uh, making use of Wi-Fi network or vulnerabilities. 
So there are many attacks even on home routers, like you know, Crack Attack, for example, are ones that exploit uh, weaknesses in home routers. And a lot of those haven't been patched. And uh, this is one of the other problems with home networks is that uh, they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily running the latest gear or the latest firmware on their, their routers. So they can be attacked a number of different ways. So, you know, in that home scenario, it's, it's really quite difficult. I mean, I just look at my own situation. I think it'd be near impossible for me to control, you know, what the kids were doing, where they were going. And for me to try and sort of patch every device and say, look, everything you do needs to go through a VPN, including my kids, I think at this point of impracticality. And VPNs tend to slow systems down as well. So the last thing kids want to do is use a VPN. So I suspect that at best you can, you know, limit use a VPN to say for company communications for specific events, but outside that people probably won't use it, uh, which means that, you know, that opens the door for getting into that network. I'd like to get you to talk, Mike, just when you mentioned uh, the structure of those keys. So, for example, if people living in Australia, most people would have a, a Telstra or Optus device. Can you walk through what that actual process would look like? Because there probably is a number of people that are just using the generic key that they were assigned. So can you talk a little bit more about what that actually looks like and how that works? Oh, so you're talking about the WPS uh, situation or...? Yes, but then also in terms of um, the generic sort of passwords that people are getting from oh. their telco providers. Yeah, yes. So you'll see on the back of a modem, you'll actually see a preset key that's used password to access the system. And most people literally just type that in and use that to access it. And these are randomly generated keys, but they're not totally random. They, they follow a structure from the, the manufacturer. Hackers know what that structure is. So it makes it quite a bit easier to crack the passwords because they know what sort of, you know, number length, uh, number range, et cetera, that they're looking for, the, you know, potentially patterns in that as well that they can use. So I've got a list of kind of, you know, the top 20 things I'd recommend people do for securing their routers. And there are a number of things people can do to make it a lot more difficult for hackers and yeah, certainly recommended to do. But, but even if you do all those things, um, things like man-in-the-middle attacks are extremely difficult to protect against because if you have, for example, if you take that example of that you gave of the person who's um, got a laptop from work and they've got a VPN on that laptop and it auto connects to the home network, well, if I set up a man in the middle access point that looks like your home network, it's a fake access point, that laptop will connect to that network um, mm -hmm. and then try to run the VPN across that network. So I can then control that VPN communication. I can control where it terminates, where it goes to, what it's, how it's connecting. And even if it doesn't successfully connect, there are ways to capture information from that laptop prior to the VPN connection connecting. So there is, depending on what ports are protected under the VPN, depending on what some of the other technologies that are used, uh, VPNs aren't a fail safe for all communications. They, they tend to only protect certain communications and you know let other, other stuff pass through. So if, for example, you're uh, connecting on a VPN, for example, and it takes a couple of minutes for the VPN connection to go, your phone or laptop could already have exchanged kilobytes or megabytes of information with the internet prior to that VPN connecting. So there's always this, you know, opportunity before you connect where you're vulnerable. And also you've got to make sure you're connecting to the right network in the first place. Mm -hmm. So they're probably the key ones for home Wi-Fi. But yeah, denial of service is another one. So, you know, just nuisance value too. So if you if you did say a deauth attack on a home network, that you know, that can be quite annoying. For, you certainly wouldn't get much work done if you were reliant on Wi-Fi if somebody had one of those devices going. And I've had to deal with uh, cases in real life where people have been domestic disputes where they've had people who understand this technology and been causing havoc on those households. So, um, you know, there are malicious cases too where, where this occurs, not just out sort of, you know, corporate espionage, but certainly people who are trying to create harm. One of the things that I thought was really interesting that you mentioned was the manufacturers and their equipment mm -hmm. trying to find the cheapest way. So do you think that this will evolve, that they'll try to make their equipment better? I understand their reasoning because no one wants to pay more money for stuff, but then ultimately it's opening up that sort of attack vector anyway. But do they kind of just think, well, it's not really my problem. I'm just manufacturing this stuff and then I'll be done with it. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, okay, interesting. You, you hit the nail on the head. It's. I'll give you some real case examples of discussions I've had. Mm -hmm. I was involved in a review group that was reviewing the, the whole smart card industry for banks. Mm -hmm. And we we're actually, I had the heads of the banks in this room and we were actually running a workshop with them talking about, uh, you know, embedding chips to actually make fraud 
disappear amongst you know credit card transactions and really improve you know reduced risk dramatically uh, and we got into this conversation the conversation was really simple it was this is how much our risk insurance costs this is how often people defraud the credit card this is how much money it costs us if we were to actually spend another two dollars on every plastic card that goes out that would be way more than what we're spending on insurance so the equation was actually black and white for them they just said it's just not worth it there was absolute recognition there was a growing problem but what's interesting that equation does tip so the price of uh, smart chips comes down so the cost of securing the card gets to a point where it's it's easier and secondly online transactions increase so you get to this crossover point on the graph where they must do it and that's actually mm -hmm. what happened you saw that we replaced mag stripe cards with chip cards for example and that's because the cost was you know there's negligible difference or the difference was was still cheaper than the insurance cost so the banks will do it but the financial equation has to work so it's a very similar thing with the telcos and i had a really interesting discussion with a a company that builds fpos software for the banks and for merchants so uh, they build a very secure software stack so um, you know if you want to buy some stuff from kfc or you know the local supermarket whatever it might be and you're doing an fpos transaction you can have wireless terminals that will send information back to the register and you know, open the internet and do the transaction so we actually approached them and said look you know this is a, a classic environment where you need hack hunter to um, you know help protect somebody who for example somebody who had a went to a coffee shop, didn't like their coffee, decided to cause havoc on their networks and stop all their FPOS machines working and knocking out wireless. So he said, if you had a hack hunter, you could detect that straight away and find the perpetrator. Uh, their answer to that was, we reckon there's about 5% of transactions that look dodgy or not too much dodgy, but uh, situations where people are causing havoc on the network where we need that. And in those cases, it's not our problem, it's the merchant's problem. So they basically said, look, we provide the software or we provide the equipment, but we, we're not responsible for solving that problem for the cafe. So the person who would have to purchase that solution would actually be the cafe owner. And the cafe owner doesn't really have the expertise or understanding of, of what's actually going on in the first place. So you have this really you know, big divide, if you like, between um, people who do know what's going on, have the opportunity to fix it, simply have no financial motivation to do that. Uh, and as long as they can pass the buck on to, to a person and let them be the ones to deal with it, they will continue to do that. So it is a potentially, you know, over time, um, we might get a situation where the public become far more educated on security. They will uh, understand what those issues are and they will insist on manufacturers providing those features or only buy devices with those features. But, um, you know, it takes quite a, a major awareness campaign. It, it not only that, it requires probably, unfortunately, a lot of people to suffer in a security context before they realize they need this um so you know that's that's kind of unfortunately the world we live in where you know you get to that threshold you need to have that level of pain i, I agree with you absolutely and that unfortunately is the case before people start listening that something quite severe needs to happen do you think that even in the future they may even sort of bring in like manufacturing standards for this type of equipment because then it's sort of yeah, they're, well, they're meeting them halfway yeah, so, well, to give you a bit of a history of um, this particular vulnerability in routers, as I said, it was discovered a long time ago, and it was actually the community found it, put a patch forward in 2009. Mm -hmm. So, now, interestingly enough, Microsoft were one of the first companies that patched it, because it has to be patched in the end device as well as the routers. It's not something you can just do in one piece of equipment. So, what happened was, um, believe it or not, Apple were the problem. So, uh, back in 2009, Apple refused to put this software in their, their iOS devices. So what happened is that because of that, router manufacturers could not put this feature in because then they wouldn't be able to connect to an iPhone. So right. they couldn't make that a mandatory default feature. Mm. And because they could make it mandatory default, there was no point even including the technology because nobody was going to switch it on who had an iPhone. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until iOS 6 or the iPhone 6 came out that Apple actually introduced the patch. Now, that was a long time after 2009. Mm -hmm. Significant time. Millions of routers were produced, you know, prior to Apple patching it. So the Wi-Fi consortium since then has said things like 802.11n, Wi-Fi standard when that came out, it was it was actually was suggested that encrypted management frames, which would fix this problem, was the standard part of that router firmware. 
but very few manufacturers implemented it because it was an opt-in. When you went to uh, AC, 802.11ac networks, it was seen as a mandatory requirement to get that sort of stamp of approval. But once again, it's you know how many how many um, routers are actually just producing an AC connection? They'll they'll be backwardly compatible with other standards. And what happens when you have that backward compatibility? Because people have old equipment at home, is people say, look, I don't want my TV not talking to my router, so I have to use the you know the the, the fallback arrangement on the router, which means that I'm open to this now. So you, we, there was a study done, I can't remember the name of it offhand, but I can certainly find it for you, but there was a study done on um, uh, looking at the uptake of new Wi-Fi technologies, and it took uh, roughly six years for a new Wi-Fi feature to work, to penetrate 60% of the market. Wow, six years, that's quite a long time. Yeah, so if you follow the same curve, uh, let's say – uh, Wi-Fi 6 coming out or just started to come out in routers we, we see today in WPA3 standards, you, if you look at that, you'd say, hey, great, there's some new security features in there. They won't solve all the security problems, but there are some good security features in there. You know, when are we likely to see that at home? Well, I'd hate to say it, but, you know, probably not for about, you know, four or five years, maybe six years before you, you start to see these in the home environment. So uh, bottom line is, unless the average mum and dad's complaining about, getting attacked or being affected by this, then uh, it's not going to change. And unfortunately, a lot of the attacks, people aren't even going to know. And exactly. I was just going to say they'd have to be aware for, for them to complain. Wi-Fi is being attacked if you if you don't understand how these technologies work. So um, the example of where I was helping this person who was being attacked by um, an ex-husband of his sister, it was a really serious situation where the person was not only hacking their network and getting access to information and stopping them using the network, uh, they're hacking into their cell phone systems, the whole bit. So it was really quite sophisticated. It might sound like this person was paranoid, but you know, if you know enough about the industry, you know that he was actually uh, telling the truth. So you know, these people just can't get help. You know, this person actually tried ringing specialist IT companies, uh, ringing the, the the police, the federal police various government bodies, not a single person offered help. And he was actually almost in tears when we said, you know, we're happy to see what we can do to help him. So that was kind of a fascinating insight into the industry as well, that Mm -hmm. even when you've you've got this person who's actually quite technically able and realized they had a serious problem, they couldn't even get help from the general industry. So, you know, it's kind of like, you know, sink or swim on your own a little bit. You've got to really kind of find these kind of solutions yourself, which is really kind of a sad position, but I, I suspect mm. it will become more savvy over time. So because people are working from home and are probably will be doing this type of work from home or they're doing it on rotation throughout their working week for the foreseeable, how should companies be changing the conversation around protecting all their endpoints? You know, one of these is just good hygiene. So, you know, making sure that there's a nice little checklist you know, things like having strong passwords, um, you know, putting what we call MAC address controls on devices, which means that only certain devices can connect. Mm-hmm. Uh, hiding your SSID, there's, there's a whole heap of them, and I'm, I'm happy to share that information if anybody is interested. Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly, you know, that's one thing, you know, that sort of hygiene aspect about doing some basic protection. But the other aspect is is certainly using VPNs where, where possible. Um, but the other one, I think, really, really importantly, is I think corporations need to step up and provide some sort of surveillance and, uh, you know, measurement systems uh, on endpoints for their corporate citizens. So in, rather than just saying, hey, it's not my network and, you know, it's not my responsibility, I think they need to put some sort of IoT devices out there that can sit and watch for this stuff and they can report back to base and they can keep these people safe. I just, you know, I'm concerned about that reliance on, on the staff member to do everything themselves. I just think that's it's a mm. fail. It's, you might be lucky if you've got a few IT people who understand this stuff might be able to implement this properly, but I suspect, you know, it's going to be a small percentage of people will be able to do this well. No, you're absolutely right. Do you think companies are sort of doing this type of monitoring at the moment or not really? From my own experience, no. And part okay. of the, the sort of the corporate culture, which suggests that, you know, the buck stops at the, the corporate head office, right? So, you know, what you do at your home is your own business. And uh, I've had a, a, quite a few conversations with some senior execs in, in large corporations about this very issue. And you get it, it's quite a varied response. It's not not as um, simple as you may think. So some organisations take it quite seriously. Uh, but when I say they take it seriously, they don't tend to put a lot of monitoring gear at the home network. They just tend to mm. 
put a couple of basic things like have a VP, um, give them a corporate laptop that's been uh, protected properly, yep. you know, or things like that. Other companies and quite a large number of companies don't do anything. And yes. there's a group that actually put in special protections when people travel. So they tend to ignore the home, um, but they'll actually put in protections when they travel. So they might say, look, if you're traveling, use this special VPN dongle or um, use this you know, VPN software that we've got and we'll, we'll, we'll set up a laptop for you so they can do that specifically and we'll make sure it's got some you know, very special security equipment on there so it can monitor just in case you have a problem. And we were actually um, in, in a position, we were looking at supplying um, traveling execs with a portable, ver- a very small version of our device that could alert them when they were traveling. If they were, say, in a hotel overseas and they were using Wi-Fi, I could tell them straight away if that was a problem. Um, so, you know, there are situations, special situations where companies take this seriously if they're traveling to, you know, say, you know, some parts of the world that have, you know, particularly um, uh, not so nice track record on, on security. Mm-hmm. And we, and there's a there's a group called uh, Dark Hotel who is a you know this is a professional group who go around hacking people at hotels so it's a pretty serious problem for people who are travelling. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so it's it, it's been an issue for travelling execs for quite a while. But but I think what we have now is with the home work situation is that we've opened up a whole new can of worms. And certainly recent discussions with some of the big companies um, just not long ago actually they were actually the security staff themselves were. Um, having to rethink completely about the whole security approach because this work from home arrangement is really changed things quite dramatically. The other thing that's interesting is we're speaking to someone, a uh, multinational company, and the thing that blew me away was that some of their people, they were only operating on desktops when they're in their office. So it meant, which completely perplexed me, that they now are operating off their own personal laptops. They were not given a corporate yeah. device. I, I don't know in terms of the situation, in terms of if they have any monitoring. I don't think so. They're probably using some type of VPN, I'd say. But I would say that's it. Do you think that's pretty common? Uh, unfortunately, yes. BYO equipment has been adopted by varying degrees with the corporations, and it seems to be growing. And I think part of the problem is that everybody wants a new phone. Everybody wants, you know, a new laptop. Uh, Their kids have got iPads and Android tablets and and who knows what. So companies are basically saying, hey, look, you know, I no longer need to buy equipment for you to connect to the internet. And a lot of our services are cloud-based now. So companies are seeing this as a way to save a lot of money. Gotcha. Uh, You know, as long as you've got a cloud-connected device, why do I need to supply the device? And, hey, you know, if I make the cloud application very secure, why do I even need to worry about the device? You know, just trusting in that alone that, you know, the device doesn't need to be secure is a bit naive. And the, the Wi-Fi router is part of that device environment. So it's going to open up a real problem for companies who have that attitude. I think partly it's naive. And I think partly it's just historical. Mm-hmm. And I guess the other, the, the other sort of complexity adding to your points would be because this wasn't a planned thing. They're just like, we just need to get people working. So, yes, it's not the yeah. best solution. Uh, just utilize a VPN. You've got to use your own laptop. But I mean, like you said, if you had to go out and buy thousands of new laptops, like the procuring of those types of laptops um, may become difficult, uh, just like when they were trying to procure even basic medical uh, and then sort of trying to go about navigating that would be another huge program of work. So I think that I understand the sort of situation. I was just really curious and asking that uh, it is common and it, and it is. But what I'd like to ask you and to wrap up our conversation conversation because it's been incredibly uh, insightful is what do you sort of see on the horizon for this space when it comes to staff working from home in terms of the present of what's happening but then also for the foreseeable future? This is an interesting one because I always like sort of looking to the future a little bit and seeing you know what the world's going to look like. Um, you know having go through the COVID work from home situation and gosh you know the, the sheer scale of that worldwide it's hard to imagine it's going to go back to the same and I've had a couple of conversations with friends of mine who work uh, you know, one works in a major bank and um, another one, uh, I can't remember what organisation they work for, quite a large one, but um, in both cases they said that the corporation has turned around and said we're actually going to adopt work from home as a mainstream solution and we're not going back to the office for a lot of people. Like that was a pretty interesting statement this early on in the process. They're basically saying it saves them so much money and it's working so well that you know, they're not going back. So I imagine we're going to get a, a massive glut of uh, office space in their CBDs as a result of this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also think the implications of that are 
that working from home is going to be the new normal and um, it will only be exceptional stuff where people come in. So uh, to the extent that that happens across industries, hard to pick, but I think enterprises are going to use this as a way to streamline their operations and save a lot of money. And I suspect that there won't be an equal injection of security put into that um, to fund that process as much as I would like. But nevertheless, I think that's where it's going, and I think the enterprises are going to need to take on a lot of responsibility to secure that work environment from home. The way I kind of think of it is, you know, in the office, you have to make sure the ergonomics of your chair are right. It's, uh, you know, you've got lumbar support and you don't get, you know, carpal tunnel syndrome from uh, typing mm-hmm. at the angle, et cetera. Mm-hmm. The responsibilities for the work environment need to be shifted to home. And there's no reason why an employer should say, hey, I care what chair you sit on at work, but I don't care what chair you sit on at home. They need to kind of have the same philosophy around, you know, security at home as well. And I extend that beyond just Wi-Fi as well. I mean, there, there are other aspects like securing the house itself, securing equipment, locks on doors, alarm systems. You could go overboard here. But, you know, if you've got somebody who's a high-level C-level exec in an organisation who's privy to very sensitive information, I'd be treating the home work environment as a, a place that needs to be secured in totality. No, you're absolutely right. And I think those are really, really great insights. And I've definitely heard it from a range of other people I've been interviewing uh, on our podcast as well. So, Mike, I really, really love the chat. I got a lot of information out of it. I think our listeners did as well. It gave another perspective on what's sort of happening in terms of the way our economy actually is moving forward with the working from home situation. And if people uh, are wanting to reach out to you, perhaps they've got a question that I didn't personally ask you, how can they go about doing that? You can send an email to info at hackhunter.io. We'll we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And if, you know, there's certain resources that hopefully we can point people in the right direction for good health and safety. Uh, I mentioned that sort of checklist for Wi-Fi and so on. So some of those things we're trying to publish on our website and we'll do that over time. So you can look at the hackhunter.io website as well. It's still under development. There's a few little things that we're doing with it, but certainly there's contact information there as well if you need it. Awesome. Well, I really enjoyed the conversation. I think that you provided a wealth of information and I'm really pleased to have you on the show. So thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you, Carissa. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in. As always, we hope you got some new ideas or ways of thinking from this episode. And remember, you can always reach out to our guests if you do have more questions. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and we always love to hear your feedback. So leave a review on iTunes and we might just give you a shout out on a future episode. You can find me on LinkedIn as well as on at I am Carissa Breen on Twitter and Instagram. And if you'd like to know more about how we help tech companies, check out carissabreenindustries.com. Until next time, stay safer.